You're listening to Hayes Radio Network, Cannabis Lifestyle Radio. Welcome to another episode of Cultivate. This is a show about you and your journey in the cannabis industry. It's moving fast, but there's room for everyone. Buckle up as we bring you the people and the technology that are blazing the trail. Welcome, everyone. Today we're live at Lemon Haze here in Tacoma, Washington. We've got the one of the founders of Dope Magazine with us, myself, Scott, Lance, uh, and we're just going to talk about uh, the industry a little bit and the role Dope plays uh, in that. So, And we should divulge, nothing bad has happened to Drew. We actually decided to give him a day off. So yes, he's been uh, he's been on the road for a while. Yep, and, that must uh, be nice. Yeah, <laughs> so, Tran, Tran wow. knows, and I shouldn't. We should divulge too. It's not that we're, we're not being uh, we're not being PC, but I've always known Tran as Tran the man. Some people call him Daddy Tran, so I apologize in, the, in, in advance if I call him Tran instead of Dave. Yeah. Yeah, some that's... people call me Lambert, so I'm not offended. He has some nicknames for me. DJ but, uh, Lance Romance. <laughs> but we did need we did need to, yeah. to give Drew a day off for yeah. Cultivate, so that's the only reason why I'm crashing the party. Just well, throw it out there. Awesome. Well, let's jump right into this. What's Dope Magazine? What's your mission? Where did you start? Well, Dope Magazine started right here in Seattle in 2011, and it stands for Defending Our Plant Everywhere. And, you know, back in 2011, you know, when I first got into it, um, there wasn't a lot of information. There wasn't a lot of uh, education, and there wasn't a lot of, for me as a marketing guy, opportunities to get my brand out there. You know, if I was proud of it, how do I get people to, you know, recognize uh, what I'm doing? So it was built as well as a lot of companies out here, uh, you know, a solution for a problem. And, uh, you know, we've been on this incredible ride of learning and telling stories. And uh, really for us, it's always about information, education, and really connecting the industry. And you've done good with it. That's one thing, you know, we first met, it was right after uh, the cannabis got launched. I remember I was jamming the cannabis and we crossed paths. And you guys definitely started a few years before we did. Um, but I like the fact that you weren't offended when I, I used to reference, like, you guys are the modern day high times. And you're like 100%, like, we're doing something different here. Like, we're, we are the education and we are the outlet. For, for our gen, like you and I are Gen X, and we've got, you know, obviously we've got a Gen Y in the house too, but I really do feel like Dope spoke to the modern day consumer of cannabis, right? Well, big time, yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, High Times has been an incredible legacy uh, product that's been around when I started smoking cannabis 25 years ago. Yeah. So that was my reference to the industry, and that was what the illicit market was. That was our world. Uh, people exactly. were in fear of being prosecuted. People were hiding away their infinity for it. And uh, we just came in at that perfect opportunity where, you know, the transition was happening. And so we felt like there was a need to tell that story also. And of course, all due respect to, to, to High Times. You know, I think that's a big honor to be yeah. called the New Day High Times. I mean, I think that yeah. should be a compliment to High Times too. Uh, and not so to jump ahead, that, yeah, that's we're, we're kind of, I guess, a perfect segue. Congratulations are in order because, <laughs> yeah. Dave, you were one of the founders. I mean, you and Evan, you, you guys are rock stars, and you've been going at this. A lot of people don't recognize. So starting this as many years as you did, it's like dog years in this industry, dude. Like I said, I'm only 100% focused for the last almost five years. But we've seen so much change. But you guys stuck through it, built a phenomenal brand. I mean, it definitely transcends all audiences, all demographics. And you guys just got picked up by High Times. You just you just sold the High Times, man. Well, What's huge, up? It's a huge milestone. You know, when you embark on this journey and you push off from land, you don't know where you're going. And um, in cannabis, especially true, it's not like I have a roadmap to get to this new world. And you're building the boat as you're moving forward. It's getting bigger, you're picking people up, but again, there's no roadmap. And so it's been a long journey. And you know, with the High Times deal, it's come full circle. We've made some, you know, we found land. Uh, I feel like now we're able to navigate the industry even stronger and, you know, continue to focus in on what 
the core of what we were doing of connecting and defending our plant everywhere and being able to having a bigger platform is going to allow us to help more people, uh, help more businesses have tools to succeed in this industry. And here we are. We're going to build a, you know, a, a new world. And I think this is a great start, great opportunity for cannabis and obviously a great opportunity for Dope Magazine. Awesome. Yeah. Sweet. And and to your point, the whole industry has come a long way. Even the three, four years that I've been in it, what are some challenges you're still facing today with just advertising and the whole uh, outlook on cannabis? Well, to me, besides the, 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 the obvious ones of, you know, social media being a big aspect of your business and, you know, I've owned bars for a very long time and, you know, people are, you know, look at it and go, oh, cool, social media is my only form of marketing. But to me, you must take a 360 approach. And this is going to come in paid media, earned media, you know what I mean? If you're proud and this is what you're doing, you must live the brand. And that means, like I see Lance everywhere, I see you in Anaheim, I see you there. It takes these type of efforts as well as social media, as well as advertising and uh, uh, platforms like High Time and even culture and lemon haze and all of the different brands so as we have more companies that are that, that, that are sick and you know get into this business you know which is not easy whatsoever I could tell you and you see the blood and the scars that we've gotten our ass kicked yeah, yeah. you know over the last seven years and learned some valuable lessons but how do I now take all of these lessons and help other companies. And that's why we support uh, shows like Lemon Haze we don't, and, and Leafly and all these other partners because to me, this industry is a, a nascent industry with lots of opportunity for everyone. It only succeeds if we're all in it together. Yeah. Only way. Yeah. yeah. It's all good vibes too. I think there's a lot of, and that's you You and I both, Dave. I mean, being, being modest, but we are a bit of influencers. We have pe people that hit you up all the time. We've talked about this, where people approach us, go, what does it take to get in the industry? What do I need to do? You know, I'm coming from this background, that from medical, from business, from, from you know, the pharmaceutical, whatever. People from t all different aspects. But I think both of us agree it all comes back to that good vibes and, and positive energy, right? You can't be in it for the wrong reasons. And at first, when I started hearing from people like in Australia, we have friends down there like Max Stone with the Hemp Embassy. And I'd always hear him preaching, free the plant, free the plant. And at first I was like, it seems a little cheap. And then I'm like, no, that makes sense. Like, it really is freeing this plant that unlocks so much. I'm a huge medical advocate, so that's yes. my angle. But, I mean, we're in it for a bigger reason. It's well, not we, for any of us individually. Well, we're all trying to open up the conversation and have bigger conversations. That's what, you know, media is, right? How do you tell the story of the industry? How do, you know, for us at Dope, it's like, how do we focus on the people and their relationship to the plant? Because that's the normalization part. It's right. not necessarily the products, but it's how am I going to be looked at if I try cannabis? Yeah. That yeah. is why most people are in the closet. It's not because of the products. It's not because of that. It's because of what my uncle's going to think. My mom's going to think if I told her I tried cannabis. If I'm 100%. a grandma and I'm going to tell my, my grandchildren, what are they going to think that grandma smokes pot? But, you know, the more and more the narrative changes and the more and more we use our platforms to tell the right message, there's a huge responsibility in what we do. Yeah. I agree 100%. We both have kids. That's the thing that's yeah. interesting, too. We're, we're family men. We have families at home. And you've probably had that conversation, too. My son has asked what I do. He's seven years old, mature for his age. Yeah. But he's like, what are these dead flowers? Why, why are these pictures with dead flowers in your product? And I said, well, son, that's actually medicine. It's natural medicine. But even a seven-year-old normally associates medicine with these pills yeah. and these liquids. Yeah. And it's interesting that we're having to educate something that was a century or two ago was the norm. Yeah. I mean, right, because cannabis yep. was the norm before prohibition, before reefer madness and, and Nixon and Dare and yeah. all this stuff that we dealt with Which over the years. Which is really right? amazing because, you know, my children are not going to have the same perception about the plant they're going to be what are you talking about that this was illegal what are you talking about that this is bad and that is part of this process and I see the older generation and not to say that they didn't do a lot for us you know in this world but you know a lot of the you know the the transition is is moving on and I get excited and that that's a win for me when I start seeing that older generation turn around and I've been a part of so many moments where people are trying it for their first time and yeah. 
I'll tell you, there's nothing more exhilarating for me than 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 uh, than seeing that and being a part of that. And I, Definitely. I'm 25, and I have a kid on the way. You and do. I just, <laughs> and, I, yeah. and I think about like just my upbringing and the perception on cannabis when I was uh, being raised, and how different that's going to be from how my kid yeah. is going to be brought up and the perception that he has on. It. Yeah. I mean, by the right. time that he understands what's going on yeah. it could be legalized all across the US and it's yeah. inevitable that yeah. that's going to happen yeah. and it's amazing because I mean I have a 20 year old daughter also as well as two other daughters and you know many seven years ago she helped me paint my first cannabis store Yeah, yeah. and now we're taking dabs together and yeah. <laughs> you know I'm still at that point where I'm looking over my shoulder going is this ethically right but damn straight, it's right. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's uh, And then how is this, right? You, you stop and you go, and again, you and I, we're, we're same generation. We're very, I think we're same age, actually, man. But you're right. I still, I'm like that. And honestly, Hollywood doesn't help either, no. right? I mean, they still they still stereotype that quintessential stoner. It doesn't matter if it's Pineapple Express yep. or for you and I, if it's Kumar or if it was, you know, Cheech and Chong. Like, it's unfortunate that even uh, Disjointed, as you remember a show, I think it was Netflix put out. Yep. Yep. And Disjointed and... That really kind of riffed the industry a little bit because those of us in the industry are like, here we go with the stereotypes again. Yeah, like yeah. Hollywood just cannot get it right. Yeah. Like don't show the stereotypical stoner and the stereotypical this, stereotypical that. Like, show the true story of how it makes a difference in people's lives of all ages, yeah. right? But right. the truth yeah. is, I mean, the cannabis industry is a very powerful demographics, economically yeah. and politically. And nowadays you cannot fool you know, uh, this demographics with a movie like that because the, you know, the ratings will show. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Right? Power uh, to the people, right? Yeah, I mean, we're <laughs> that, that's where it is. And, I, and the good part is that in the background, I hear these wonderful conversations about telling a realistic uh, story about cannabis. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and it ends up being really just normal people that use cannabis in their lives. All kinds. And, and they're fascinating yeah. people and they're doing incredible things. They're fathers, they're they're you know what I mean? They're 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 business people that take yeah, care lawyers, of a lot of doctors, people. Doctors, yeah. I know all kinds. I mean, the, uh, ironically, the only people I come across, and this is very unique, and you're right, like Dave, you and I, we, and even Scott when he travels talks about how you hey, yeah, where, where are you going to? Oh, I'm going to a convention. Oh, what convention are you going to? Cannabis. Like we're all comfortable with saying that. You have flight attendants, you have Uber drivers. I've had Firefighters are like a two. I don't want to mess they with my pension now, it. but I'm retiring in two years. I yep. want to get in this industry. I yes. don't just want to openly consume. Yes. I mean, truck drivers who are like, dude, my pain, my sleep issues. I wish I could, yep. but I can't with the license I carry. Yep. I mean, there's so many people who are like, if not for this, I would be doing that. For sure, you know. So it's crazy. Eventually, that eventually that is changing, and I, yes. I, it's 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 so amazing to be a part of history in the making. Yeah. You're right. When these things are transitioning, you're a part of history. And I think Very that's true. amazing. And I look around here and I see, you know, I just see a room full of pioneers, people yep. that believe 100%. in freedom, yep. people that believe in making their own choices and not following uh, the norm and what, what, what is being told to them yeah. like robots. And I think that's what's amazing about cannabis and the people yeah. uh, of this industry. Very Can true. we get a little insight on your perspective on the Northwest? How is it same as other regions? How does it differ? Yeah. I mean, it's it's a it's a booming market. So, what's your take on? Well, it? I mean, when you're a pioneer and one of the first to legalize, believe me, you they 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 make it happen, and then let's figure it out afterwards. Yes. There's no amount of time that you can give yourself to set this up because where's the game plan? Where who's done it before? There's no blueprint. Exactly. Yep. So I'm just telling you there, there's a room full of freaking bosses here that have went through that and again there's this to me there's a, a given respect already. Yep. If you're still around here and you're one of the brands here in Washington that've gone through this transition and really laid the foundation for all these other states to legalize, you are a tough person. Yep. Yeah. And that's what people don't realize. We've had this discussion. So I, I, myself, even growing up in NorCal, being around it, everything, I jumped in with both feet in Colorado in January 14 with the cannabis. You, you guys obviously had already been doing it. 
But these two states, I mean, it was really it's Colorado, Washington, and then everyone else. Yep. And that's the thing that a lot of people didn't realize is they changed everything around the rules and regulations, a lot of the stipulations, 85 times in the first year in Colorado. Yep. We stopped reporting on it because it is such a commonality for them to go, oh, wait, we forgot about this. Yep. Or wait, this does apply. That doesn't apply. I mean, it's constantly changing, right? I'm just like, here, Lance, uh, shoot this target. Yeah. <laughs> okay, shoot this target while, me- <laughs> while juggling and while on one foot. Do yeah. that for me. Yeah. Yeah. And not to date myself, but it reminds me of Brody on the boat. Remember the last scene in Jaws where he's trying to shoot the tank in the shark's mouth and he's floating yeah. on on the very top of the boat, the water's moving, the shark's jumping up. I'm like, that's our industry because yep. the targets are constantly moving, to your yep. point. Yep. Like Agreed. the rule, they don't change it at halftime. The rules are changing every 10 minutes yep. in this game. Yep. And one of those changes could sink anybody already. Yes. A packaging change can sink your whole thing. You lose $100,000. Just by having to change up your packaging to compliance. You might right? not be. Yeah. Oh, sorry. We need opaque payroll. bottles. We don't need clear bottles. Exactly. And you just got a whole land sea container yep. full of clear bottles, right? Yep. So, yeah, definitely hear the stories. It's craziness. All right. One last question. It's kind of a hard one, I know. Sure. What's, what's your sp- perspective on the future of the cannabis industry? Where do you think we're going in the next three, five, ten years? Well, Canada just set a real precedence for the world. Yeah. Right? So yeah. I think if you're thinking about the future, we all have to inevitably think a couple steps ahead and know that legalization is on the horizon. Yeah. Right. And how do we set up this infrastructure to do this correctly? Because this could be a benefit to everyone in the United States and beyond. Yeah. If we do it. I mean, I wanted to say correctly, but that's, you know what I mean? You just got to jump in and do it. Right. Yeah. So for me, seeing that there are a lot of small companies right here and knowing that to your point earlier, that when this infrastructure goes on, there's going to be big companies that are just going to stroll in casually, right, with all of the resources, yep. right, and go, you know what? I mitigated my risk over these years. Now I can go either acquire companies or I can just buy human capital and build this myself. And I yep. think, uh, you know, that's where you see a lot of acquisitions and a lot of consolidation right now because you're almost kind of forming right now alliances. Yeah. yeah. But when that happens, you're going to be a product of getting acquired or you're going to be able to compete against those bigger companies Take it level because up, you right? have the resources, yeah. you've gone public, you have the you know the public uh, funds that are coming in. So I'm excited. I mean about a lot of things in the industry but yeah. you know just to think that i'm in a generation that cannabis is going to be federally legal i just it's crazy i it's, it's i exciting. i'm just yeah. like uh, 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 is this real <laughs> yeah. am yeah, i waking up every day man. and this is yeah. what i talk about and and think about it. we've been in this industry for a few years which like yeah. you said our dog years Think yep. about how many people we can help when that happens. Yeah. And think about how many things that content like this can help one person who's thinking about it and is going to start a business in 2022. I know. <laughs> it sounds so far off, but it's not. It's and not. And you're right. And it is. And I think, you know, ju- I just wrote an article for Hero Grown, a great, great group that we they sponsor vets and first responders. And my article was talking about Canada coming online. But I really put it into perspective because I, I know America is busy, but that was a watershed moment. Yeah. We get it. You just stress that. I mean, that is Uruguay. That was awesome. That was awesome being the first country in the world to legalize cannabis. But Canada is a G7 country. I mean, this is they are the second landmass nation only to Russia. Right. I mean, this is a big country. And I, I was trying to share that the bigger story. And, and again, we've talked about this. It's not just what's happening domestic. It's quite honestly, Canada's got 36 and a half million people. Heck, that's less than what the state of California has. But what are they doing internationally? Yeah, I mean, I we're running into them in South America and Australia and Germany and Spain and Portugal. They got plants all over. I mean, they're really, from a global perspective, they are going to take it to the next level, right? For sure. For sure. I mean, that's going to be the big deal. Well, and, you know, again, a year from now when we're sitting here and discussing this, they're going to have a year of analytics. They're going to have a year of taxes. They're going to have a year of all that. And you know what? The world is going to wake up and go, WTF, what are we doing? Yeah. We better get this together 
Uh, and, you know, that's going to go for the United States and some of the other ones. And I think that's just such a, a exciting moment. You know, someone has to be a pioneer and do it when it wasn't supposed to be done. And yeah, it's not going to be perfect. All of us are gonna, might complain about it over the next few years. Oh, Canada didn't do this right, this right. So fucking what? Yeah. Oops, sorry. It's all right. No. <laughs> this is this it's is all not, good. Yeah, it's, we get passionate. Good. We get yeah. passionate about it. So it's you heard good. it here, folks. Live <laughs> at Lemon Haze. This is Cultivate. David, thank you Thanks, for guys. being on the show. Appreciate He's one of the founders of Dope. Lance, always a this pleasure. Has been fun. Thank you fun, uh, for everything you're doing in the industry. Thank you, guys. Stay dope. Listening to Hayes Radio Network, Cannabis Lifestyle Radio. Welcome to another episode of Cultivate. This is a show about you and your journey in the cannabis industry. It's moving fast, but there's room for everyone. Buckle up as we bring you the people and the technology that are blazing the trail. Please buckle up as we bring you the people and technology that are blazing a trail in the cannabis industry. Uh, today's uh, podcast is going to focus on an international crisis of evaporation. What's happening to cannabis flower from the time it is uh, cured and stored until the time it reaches the consumer. We're going to have some great guests for this. We got Brian Rice coming in from the uh, R&D department at Boveda, and we've got John Burfellow, our resident expert in British Columbia. So I'm Drew Emmer, and this is Scott Swale. Hi, Scotty. How are you doing, Drew? Really good. Before we jump into this awesome interview with John Burfello and Brian Rice, we're going to throw it to Lance Lambert for a two-minute industry update segment. Here we go, Lance. Hey, guys. Lance Lambert here from Bovida, ready to give you a cannabis catch-up. First, we'll start off this week domestically in the sunshine state of Florida. Florida has a company called Fat Dog Spirits that just came out with their new specialty brand called Nirvana Spirits. So Nirvana is looking to create both gin and vodka that's infused with hemp-based CBD. So while that sounds really exciting that there's going to be some infusion going on, you're still mainly going to enjoy the attributes of the alcohol. The one thing that CBD will likely help out with though is maybe a little bit of that hangover the next morning. Still props to them for being innovative and looking ahead of the curve. Next up we have our headquarter home state of Minnesota. So in Minnesota, the largest county is no longer to criminally prosecute marijuana possession offenses. So we're actually speaking of Hennepin County, Minnesota. According to a new policy announced last week by County Attorney Mike Freeman, this is going to change very much what happens when someone's caught with a minute amount of cannabis. This county actually holds an estimated 1.2 million people. So the fact that you have 1.2 million people and Minneapolis, Minnesota within this county is quite a big deal. Something we'll be keeping a close eye on. The last we have domestically is New Jersey. So while many of us in the industry were very much looking forward to the expedited process that was going on with the adult use legalization in the Garden State, unfortunately that felt short on Monday. So we have, of course, uh, the governor of New Jersey that's very much in support, uh, Governor Phil Murphy, his fellow Democrats, and uh, his lead in the legislature continuing to scramble as much as they could to get the votes. Even the fact that 60% of the populace of New Jersey were in favor of adult use cannabis. It came down to the final straw on early Monday afternoon, and it was clear they would not be able to muster enough votes in the state senate so good luck to you in new jersey we're rooting for you for next time that's your update for this week again thank you very much for tuning in and we look forward to catching up with you in the near future thank you lance you're a wealth of knowledge i love i love lance's updates yeah lance good. is plugged into everybody around the world and we're grateful to have him a part of our team yes all right let's jump right into this 
Johnny B. John Burfellow is with us from Abbotsford, British Columbia. We had the privilege of meeting John about five years ago. He is the CEO of Medtainer Canada. He's the owner of iGreen Planet Store. He's an advocate and an educator. He's part of the Green Cross Society, um, working. I was years yeah, ago. That was spending great a lot of time volunteering to help people understand cannabis. He's an award-winning grower. Uh, discovered and won uh, uh, awards with his uh, uh, strain known as Medicush. Uh, you can find more information about that in the Treating Yourself Alternative Medical Journal. A uh, lot of really compelling articles about John, a um, lot of resources. It's going to be really easy in this podcast to get um, off on a bunch of rabbit trails about a bunch of different subjects. But the main focus of today's uh, podcast is the crisis of evaporation and specifically in Canada. And why do we call it the crisis of evaporation? Because people all over that are growing cannabis are losing quality money due to evaporation. <clears throat> so you may know it or you may not, but your cannabis is drying out very rapidly in some regions, uh, faster than others. And all of that good stuff is going out into the air atmosphere and it's lost. You're not getting it back. So that's why we brought Brian Rice, who's part of the Bovida team here. Um, Brian is our director of research and development. He works in our lab. Brian, do you want to give us a little background of, uh, who you are, where you came from? Yeah, sure. Uh, I've been at Bovida for about uh, two years, but, uh, my, uh, my background is about 20 years in packaging engineering. Uh, working on uh, innovative products and packaging uh, for the food industry, medical industry, uh, and then uh, just a lot of consumer goods. So, um, uh, yeah, that's me. So we're going to dive a little bit into uh, this whole crisis of evaporation and what it looks like for Canada and uh, everywhere else in the world. And that, so, John, you went shopping. You've done a significant amount of shopping in Canada. You deal directly with a number of LPs, and you've had a very specific experience when it comes to the quality of the cannabis when you open it and test it. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so um, pretty easy and simple. So... Uh, when it comes to cannabis in Canada on the day of legalization, I was I was excited. I was excited to take a look at what uh, the licensed producers were doing in Canada and being a medical patient and, and learning the system previously before legalization, we had already known that the cannabis was coming pretty dry. So, of course, on legalization, I went shopping. I jumped online and I bought some cannabis right away. And I, I proceeded even to buy like three grams of tweed, um, all the same, um, just because just I was curious of what standardization they had. And uh, what I came to find out was dry and not just really dry, but we're talking drier than breadcrumbs. Like, and and it was it was just such... Like you're just like, wow, did you actually just destroy something that people are trying to actually get their first enjoyment, like their first experience with cannabis and it wasn't there. So, I mean, for me, I was I was shocked to see what was happening and um, and then talking more about um, relative humidity and, and moisture content. And uh, that's when we started talking about AW. So when, and, when you uh, say dry, what do you mean? What, what, what type of readings? We sent you a, a moisture activity meter. And an AW active water machine. Yep, I think that's what it is, right? Yeah, that's correct. Water activity machine. And what were you finding? What give us just an idea of what you mean when you say it's dry? Okay, so I did some research, and I had to really learn about this talking with you guys, Brian, of course. But in the beginning, I did some research on on say AW and 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 what it really means, and and um, I found out that like say the AW active water and breadcrumbs was thirty. And then I did some more research and found out that AW and, and pasta was 50. I'm like, okay, that's pretty cool. It gives me an idea. Jam is 65. I guess that's why it goes in the fridge once you open the jar. Um, and, and I was, you know, really excited to see what was going on because I know my own cannabis is, you know, quite, you know, it's uh, it's fresh, let's just say. So uh, uh, the machine um, went into the garage and pulled out some of the, I think some of the first stuff I tested was tweed and, it came back at like 44% AW. And I'm like, well, what is that? And why is it so dry? And I tested another one um, 
out of uh, Ontario. And it came back at like 39. And I'm like, wow. Then we moved over to, say, uh, the East Coast, and that was coming back at like 29. So you just mentioned about provinces and in different elevations. So as you're hearing, and then when I got the stuff from, from BC, that was testing at 48. I, I started seeing just this difference of why is it so dry and why is everything just so all over the place? And, and, and even talking, listen to you right now talk, Scott, about, um, you know, just the provinces and different parts of the country. As you're hearing, I'm testing cannabis at different parts of the country all across Canada, and it's all roughly different. Some is too dry, some is not dry enough. You know, actually everything is too dry, right. to be honest. And for everyone listening, Brian, can you just give a little background on what water activity is and how that translates into relative humidity and moisture content? Yeah, sure. So uh, water activity measurement uh, is essentially uh, the same thing as relative humidity. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, when you take uh, a product, as, as John had mentioned, and uh, you know, t- he measured weed or pasta or jam, and if it came out at uh, you know, say 0.50 in the water activity, that 0.50 is essentially 50% um, relative humidity. So uh, there's a one-to-one ratio that you just got to move the decimal place uh, over a couple points. Um, so those are, uh, like I said, one-to-one ratio. Um, however, when it comes to moisture content, that's a totally different uh, conversation. Uh, moisture content is a total water um, that is in uh, the product that you're measuring. And typically how that's measured is uh, you'll take the, the initial starting weight of that product uh, and then dry it down as far as you can. And then you, you're taking uh, that, that measurement and then also pr- applying a percent. So it's a percent of water um, as its moisture lasts over time. Great. And as we uh, kind of talk through this, some of the some of these uh, things that we're talking about, we're going to have flash up on the screen or have available at the end of the podcast for you guys to look at. So you get a visual of what we're talking about. Um, But one thing that we have is this isotherm graph that shows that as cannabis is either absorbing moisture or um, um deabsorption coming down, um, it's going to have a different moisture content at the same water activity level. So in this chart that we're, we're looking at as cannabis is absorbing moisture, when you, when it's at 65% relative humidity or 0.65 water activity, the moisture content is right around 12%. Now on the flip side, as it's In the deabsorption phase, when it's at 65 RH or 0.65 water activity, you're at about 20% moisture content. Yeah, that really highlights um, one of the biggest reasons why um, moisture content should not be looked at as a um, a, a, a number to for safe weed, if you would. Uh, Because if you measure the, you know, like you said, you could be at 20%. Uh, and be at 65 or above, um, you know, and, and at one hand, it could be at 12%. So uh, it's a good good way to say, you know what, uh, this is how much water is in my weed, but it's not really going to tell you how safe it is or how dry it is. So if your eyes and ears have started to glaze over since we started talking technically, um, let's talk about why it's important. Um, John, why do you care about the moisture in your cannabis what's the big deal about moisture in cannabis terpenes <laughs> so okay so to your, so to your um, point as okay so everybody has uh, pure motives in this the government the lps every stakeholder has pure motives we're not criticizing anybody this is just a we're trying to show that there's a situation in the cannabis flower market that's really dire and that it's affecting people. So what's the big deal? Terpenes evaporate. What's that mean to you? What's, what's the result for you as a consumer? Well, um, as those terpenes evaporate, I'm losing that freshness. And for me, when I open up a fresh, um, here, let's just go for instance, I had major surgery and they took out um, my C4 and C5 vertebrae. And uh, they brought in, uh, Bubba Man, Mark Richards brought in 15 different terpenes. They put those 15 terpenes underneath my nose, and one of those terpenes took my pain away. So I really started paying attention. I was like, wow. So, I mean, even like when I'm smoking or fresh cannabis, when I smell that, 
wow, it opens up my eyes and I could just feel that relief. And and as I lose those terpenes, I'm losing that relief. And and if I don't have the consistency, I'm not getting that same. You hear what I'm saying? For me, for me, it's 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 plays such a huge role in helping with my pain. So when I lose it, it's too dry. It's just not there. So anymore. the patient, the, and once it's so gone, the patient it's gone. suffers when the qualities huge. in the flower are missing because it's too dry. Yes. And that's that's what I feel and how I see how cannabis affects me daily. Um, when it's too dry, it's 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 raunchy on the throat. I don't like the flavor. Um, it, it does get me there, but I'm not getting that um, true effect. I'm not getting what would you say a true experience from my cannabis because it's too dry, because I'm not getting that. I would say that standardization what I've always been striving for. And, you know, that's one reason why uh, I, I look at that humidity and we started talking about AW and I really started looking at how to standardize my cannabis for my pain was actually using humidity control. So is it fair to say, Brian, that um, this chart that we have that we'll hopefully uh, share with the world, is it safe to say that about 12% of cannabis flower is water? Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and so we're talking about a variation between 12, 11, 10, 9, 8%. Uh, Even lower. I mean, some, yeah. some LPs are drying down to 4, 5%, which is extremely dry. Well, if we look at stuff at 29, that's going to be under, yeah, I haven't seen anything at 4 or 5% yet. Because I'm just looking at your graph right now, and it's really being able to explain what I've been doing. Yeah, and, and part of the problem is unintended consequence of regulation. When they first wrote, you know, Canada's way ahead of the rest of the world as far as this whole regulatory process. But we're so far you're, behind. You're, you're, it's very uh, rudimentary, but it's still ahead of the rest of us. You're, you're way ahead of us. Yes. What, what's happened is they said dry flower. And when they said dry flower, those being regulated jumped to the conclusion that they had to have. They, they didn't. They didn't stipulate what is the. What does dry mean? What does dry mean? Yeah. And what would a good level of moisture management mean? And what what is deficient? What is uh, su su superfluous? I mean, what is going to be acceptable for a quality product? So, recently, I don't think we had any standards up until last year, right? Not that I'm aware of. We're just seeing it now. So yeah. the first introduction of standards, Scott, was only a few months ago it was announced. Yeah, the ASTM standard uh, D37. Um, I think Brian can probably speak a little bit more on this, but a standard was put in place, uh, the first cannabis, international cannabis standard, um, of how to, one, properly measure uh, moisture in cannabis. So they recommend that taking the the water activity is the most accurate and, and safe way to measure the moisture in cannabis. And then they set a, a safe range. Uh, so it starts at 0.55 and then it goes up to 0.65. So you're wanting to stay below that 0.65 because of it's below the, the mold threshold and then above the 0.55. So you're not losing as John was talking about all those terpenes as the, the plant evaporates or dries those terpenes are going to evaporate at a, a much higher rate when you get below that 0.55. Yeah. And I would have to say there's there's three big main benefits uh, for that ASTM standard. And uh, you touched on one, uh, Scott. The other one would be, um, you know, as you're looking at um, sending samples in uh, to lab to get uh, tested for the COA um, or to, to understand what the cannabinoids are on, they're also going to do a moisture content reading. So what that's going to do is that first thing is, is going to make sure that there's standardization on testing across lab to lab, across the nation, across wherever you're going to get tested. Uh, that's one thing. The other one, the second one is, um, you know, it's going to maintain that proper weight uh, through distribution. When you're packing, uh, you know, one gram or three and a half grams into a container, um, by the time that hits a consumer, uh, if it doesn't reach there, uh, it could be below that range. It could be a little below 55 um, and, and get in that dry category. Now you've got more of a, an issue from the consumer side. Uh, and they hear a lot of complaints that are going to happen. Ooh, and it's interesting about that is we have an article here that we'll share as well um, by 420 Intel. And it just talked about all of the dry cannabis across Canada. So consumers and dispensaries were weighing out stuff that they were getting from the LPs that were going to be sold to consumers and it was coming in underweight. So 
uh, an eighth that was supposed to be 3.5 grams was weighing at 3.3 or even three grams. Um, so when that consumer, yeah. Wow. So when that consumer is going to to spend, John, how much is an eighth in Canada on average? Okay. Well, um, on average from an LP, um, you have, um, we being sold uh, on a legal end to the recreational market, anywhere from $45 to an eighth up to a hundred dollars an eighth. So, I mean, you're spending minimum $45 for an eighth. You're expecting to get 3.5 grams and you get essentially ripped off because you're getting underweight cannabis. Now, one of the brands had a response to all these consumers and they said they reminded customers that over time cannabis cannabis buds lose moisture and dry up. Well, that's true. That that does happen. There's a way to to prevent that. Yep. If you have proper storage, proper humidity control, that gets eliminated completely. And not only is uh, the water being dried up, there goes your terpenes. Exactly. Well, and you're talking about two different approaches to the management of water activity. One is if you're concerned about safety, there's a whole set of things you do in order to maintain safety. And then at the same time, and the real challenge that we're highlighting in this podcast is you have to come up with a way to address quality. So if you, we don't want to um, uh, cynically talk about safety. Safety is important. We want people to have a, a safe experience. Uh, there's enough uh, inaccurate information in the marketplace about the effects of cannabis. We don't need to exacerbate that by having safety issues. That being said, the quality of what's getting to the consumer or to the patient is by our uh, uh, investigation and John, by your investigation, it's really deficient. People are really missing out because the 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 this is the evaporation issue, the dry cannabis issue, is a crisis and it's a dire crisis when people really get down to what they're getting and what they're able to get out of the product that they're buying. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry, but it, you know what? It it hurts the market and it hurts your brand, right? Exactly. Well, and it hurts the consumer because he's not getting a full sure. true experience. So someone who's trying cannabis for the first time and say they're using it for some type of ailment or control of anything like that, and they're unable to get that relief because of that improper storage or curing, they've now sold themselves short of something that could probably help them for the rest of their life because they had that one experience and it's gone. And and that's why it's so important to really look and at this. And it hurts the cause. Now. It hurts the cause. You've been fighting for 20 years to get people to let go of old ideas about cannabis. And when product gets to the marketplace that isn't as pure or as high quality as it could be for the consumer, everyone loses. The The LP loses. The um, Anybody that's in the industry, any stakeholder that's involved in this loses. And ultimately... You think about the amount of investment that the Canadian uh, people have put into this process. Everyone loses if they don't use proper humidity control to keep this stuff from getting as wretchedly dry as it's getting. Well, and one of the things that we did um, over the past year and a half is, along with obviously your help, John, is test cannabis uh, that we had purchased either from an LP or a dispensary across North America. I think we tested roughly over a hundred samples. Is that, yeah. is that correct? At and least. That, and out of that hundred samples, do you, do you remember the percentage of how many of them were below that 0.55 or 55% RH? Oh, Almost 80, 89%. So roughly 90% of the samples over a hundred samples that we had bought from dispensaries or that you've purchased from an LP have been under that 0.55. Now there has been a few that um, are in that in that range of 0.55 to 0.65, and those samples are coming from regions that have a, a high humidity already in the environment. But right. that's but that's not uh, conclusive. I mean, you're definitely going to have a better opportunity if you're in Portland, Oregon, or some moist climate. You're going to have a better opportunity to maintain uh, humidity control. But we've got readings on products that came out of Portland or came out of uh, uh, Washington State that are well below 50 percent. Mm -hmm. And that's due to people over drying. And that's go touches back to the whole regulations in Canada that say 
dry cannabis. Here's a regulation. As I'm sitting here talking to you guys, I want to do something here. And as I'm sitting here looking at all of my containers, they all say store in a dry place, dry cannabis, dry cannabis, store in a dry place, no expiry date determined. Not talking one, but I'm talking every one of these containers. I'm just reading the fine print. I normally don't wear my glasses looking at these store in a dry place. Yeah. No expired has been determined. The next one, keep out of read a chill. Dried cannabis store in a dry place, no expiry date. The next company, same thing, dried cannabis store in a dry place. So it's telling you to keep it dry and it's dried cannabis on every container that I'm reading. So that's one thing that has to change right yeah. away. And that's a big, you know, defining dry. What does dry mean? You know, and I think there's so much ambiguity on there that, hey, you know what? Because there is so much ambiguity, I'm going to go to the most extreme to make sure it's safe and dry the heck out. Well, and you need to, it needs to be properly dried to get to a level where it's useful to the consumer. So it has to be dried to a certain point. But the over drying, the overreaction to the language, and we talked to Health Canada about it, and they're emphatic in, the, in their explanation. They didn't intend for LPs to be all paranoid about whether or not they were gonna pass a test or not. They just wanted to have a modicum of safety. Mm -hmm. The standard hadn't been developed yet. Uh, there, it was safer for them from a lawyer perspective to say dry. And then it was up to whomever to decide, well, or, or to just ignore, or ignore the whole question. The result is really simple. People in Canada and the U.S., and I would submit all over the world, are buying cannabis flour that, by and large, is too dry. Yeah. And if you want to do something about it, throw a bovida in each one of your jars that's being sold, and that solves the issue. We have Whistler Cannabis Co. in Canada doing that, and they're having great results. People are happy. They're going back to rebuy their cannabis time and time again because they're getting a consistent, high-quality product. I mean, that's a, a common thing that we hear when we go to these trade shows is consumers consumers come up to our booth or patients and they say, oh, yeah, I was at so-and-so LP, but I bought their product twice and it was completely dry both times. So now I'm switching to try this LP and they're just going to bounce around until they find someone that's properly storing and curing their cannabis. You put all this blood, sweat, and tears. And in a lot of circumstances in Canada, you put a lot of, of uh, shareholder investment, a lot of cash into uh, developing a brand. And they've developed, I tell you, these people that we've met at these shows are some of the most wonderful people I've ever met in any business I've ever been involved in. Wonderful, sincere, intelligent, sharp people. And they're out there building these brands, blood, sweat, and tears. They start a brand. They get the brand going. Um, they have their LP. They create their mechanism for getting it to the consumer. And then the consumer opens the package, uh, largely like you have, John, and they have an experience of this, this, the crumble in the jar or the crumble in the bag is so ridiculous that it's just it's, it's devastated by the time it gets to you. And you've got a whole bunch of keef and you've got a really crispy buds and the smoking experience is harsh. And it's, it's uh, not what you expected. What are you going to do as a consumer? You're not going back to that brand. All that yeah. investment, all of that blood, sweat and tears that went into creating a brand, they're not going back. Yeah, right. And it's that first moment of truth, if you would, you know, hey, or if you're first time coming into the market and... Uh, you go to the dispensary and, and somebody tells you, oh, you got to try that brand. Oh, I've never tried it before. Um, pull it out and it's dry and, oh, geez, you open the container. It's, you know, it's crumbly. You can see all this stuff in a bond. Oh, geez, um, you know, I'm not going to try this again or else I'm going to go to a different LP or I'm, I'm going to go somewhere different. So you, if you want a repeat customer, um, that's a bad thing to do. All right. You don't want that first experience to just be horrible for someone. So, so let me ask an objective question about rehydrating cannabis. Do you guys believe, John, you're the expert. Um, Brian, I'll start with you just from a scientific perspective. Is it possible to rehydrate cannabis flour? If you got a shipment that registered a 29 when you went and tested it, can you put bovida in that container and have it rehabilitate over? And how long does it take to rehabilitate if it's even possible? Absolutely. <clears throat> it, is a, it is very possible to rehydrate. 
uh, another time frame to, to get it where you uh, where you want it to get, uh, whatever water activity measurement and moisture content uh, depends upon how much you you have in your storage. Or your, your, uh, and it also is dependent upon the package that it's stored in, right? So it's airtight uh, and weight is all dependent upon um, how much uh, uh, bovida packs you would throw in. So um, the good thing is, is that uh, if you can alleviate that, um, you're not only you know, maintaining those terpenes uh, inside of the bud, um, you know, your, the texture as well. So there's a lot of added benefits. So if I took an eighth out of uh, the package, John, if I put it, took an eighth out of the package that I bought from XYZ LP in Canada and I put it in the medtainer and I put a Boveda four gram in there with it and I close the medtainer, how long ballpark do you think it would be before that weed was um, acceptable? I've done this, I don't know how many times. Um, I'll get up in the morning, I'll stuff a bowl of a pack in there with some dry weed. I'll go out for the day, you see me go do events by the afternoon, it starts rehydrating. Or I'll do an event and I'll open up a, same thing, open up a package with some dry cannabis and I'll put a bowl inside a sealed container that's a completely airtight, watertight, I always say. Um, by the morning, it's fine. I always say within within 12 hours, I always find that um, if it's really hard and dense, it might take a little longer. But um, some of that fluffier weed, um, it, it, it happens over a period of probably in an afternoon. Yeah, that's a good point. But of course, it really determines on the density. Yeah. Right. And we had someone, I don't know if you remember, at, at, at the Lyft show in Vancouver. I think the first Lyft Vancouver that we did. And he came up to our booth and asked what our product was and we explained it to him. He's like, I don't, I don't believe it. That there's no way it's going to work. And so we said, well, here, try a sample, try it out on your own. As we tell everyone, you don't have to, don't take our word for it. Let the product speak for itself. So he went, took one of our four gram samples, threw it in a, a jar with an eighth, came back the next day. I ran into him in the hallway and I said, Hey, did you get to use the Bovida in your jar? He goes, dude, I have to apologize for, for being so hard on you and, and saying that your product didn't work. He goes, I opened it up this morning and it was completely different. It had already in 12 hours put so much more moisture back into it, he could smoke it. Yeah, that's a good time frame. I've, 12 hours is probably the fastest I've heard. Um, <clears throat> you know, some of the, the testing that we do here with uh, the hemp in our the innovation center, um, yeah, an eighth ounce, 24 hours is total saturation. So in a perfect world, you wouldn't be so dry that you had to take that extreme measure to get it rehydrated. In a perfect world, you'd use a, a humidity control product to um, have... Not allow those terpenes to evaporate. Right. So the <laughs> downside of having overly dry uh, cannabis is you're going to lose a significant amount of the medicinal value in the product, right? Right. And rehydrating yeah. won't get that, that back. Yeah, you can't put it back in. And I think the beauty of that, you guys mentioned that short time frame. If you're sitting in a situation uh, where you've got dry weed, you know, uh, it's been in storage and it's, you know, that 35 percent, 40 percent. And you know what? Uh, the market's great. You want to sell it quickly. Um, Boba is going to get you up there, get that all that weed up to water activity, that relative humidity faster, which is going to increase that weight. Uh, within 24 to 48 hours, depending upon the weight and density of the buds. But uh, it can happen very quickly to get um, so you can react faster to the market. Right. But the important thing is we want to get these LPs and growers all across the world using Bovida on the front end, the curing and long term storage of all their bulk flour. So it's maintained over whatever time frame you have. So it's not losing those terpenes. We have a study that shows just within 60 days, um, product stored with Bovida had a 15% higher terpene level than the, the product that didn't have Bovida. That's a lot over 60 days. And then more importantly, then once it's broken down into these small containers, you're putting Bovida in to each individual, individual container. So while it sits in your warehouse or on a shelf, that it's a perfect quality by the time it gets to the end consumer. And then it's a, a significant, uh, it's a even more significant for anybody that's buying pre-rolls because if you um, grind flour, you create more surface area and you create more exits for all that goodness to come out of the flour. And if it's not properly supported immediately and consistently, you really have a high level of degrade in a pre-roll. Pre Absolutely. 
especially when you grind it. If you're going to grind up dry weed for, you know, a joint, you're going to lose a ton of terpenes versus if it's prehydrated and at the right RH level. Um, so, yeah, keeping it at, at the good, you know, maintain level, if you, you just said, uh, Scott, yeah. uh, is going to ensure that, um, you know, you are going to get some terpenes that get lost after grinding, but, um, you know, that water, it's clinging onto the, the, the aromas. It's clinging onto the terpenes. So um, the higher the water content uh, or our water activity, the relative humidity is actually going to help preserve and maintain and keep that in there. You just said it, Brian, when you talk about relative humidity and water content, and this is a, what I would say a bomb is dropped, but these, these licensed producers and people that are packaging cannabis all around the world, when packaging, you got to control that relative humidity inside the room while packaging too. And that's something that I've kind of discovered by using these humidity control packs is controlling that relative humidity in the room while packaging with the control packs is key because you don't want to lose it. And I, I package at 70% RH and found the active water and at 60% RH and found the active water to be quite different. And that's when I was able to start really, and, and that's the last one I did. I, I'd be using Volvida, but I didn't, I was packaging at a different RH level in the room, and then it was actually rehydrating it. So there's all these little things that everybody has to really pay attention to, and there's a key part of being able to package and keep cannabis fresh, and that's going to come right down to, like you say, Scott, the beginning starts of packaging and making sure that RH level is at the proper content going all the way through from the cropping, from the curing, from the packaging to the end consumer. There's, a, there's going to be a chain that we can follow so we have that standardization. Yeah. We're going to wrap up this episode, but John, I want to ask you, um, you were a patient first, and uh, would you be so kind as to come back and join us again and have a conversation about opiates and addiction and escaping the the dragon and finding a way into a happy, healthy, peaceful state of mind and what how cannabis has played a role in that for you? I, th- I think that would be an awesome show. Hey, well, you know what? Um, I am published on this and I would love to talk more, more about how cannabis uh, basically saved my life from heavy pharmaceutical drugs. 100%. We're going to do it again. We're going to get you for that. But uh, to recap what we talked about today, just to be very simple about this, there is a crisis in the cannabis industry worldwide where there's a significant amount of value that's evaporating. And we went so far as to do a calculator based on the amount of cannabis flour that's being produced. And this this number might blow you away. This is in U.S. dollars. So it's uh, significantly more if you put it in Canadian dollars. <laughs> um, the global loss due to evaporation is estimated. This is both in storage and in packaging. The The global loss. Anybody have a guess? 44.2 billion. John, you're high. <laughs> L- literally and figuratively? <laughs> no, no pun intended. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a big problem. But 4.2 billion. That's fantastic. Uh, we estimated at 600 million, but we might be a little on the conservative that's side. The con- I mean, that's taking kind of an average. That's it's conservative, but it's a it's a huge number. So it's a lot, and it's a it's and it's preventable. A hundred percent, it is. Yep. That was one big thing that was launched in, and even with the Canadian market, a lot of these licensed producers had disclosed how much they had lost in their annual. And one disclosed they lost $147 million. And my question to them was, how much was that in the evaporation? Right. And I mean, the, the cool thing too, so if, if you're an LP or a grower and you want to learn what it would cost to, to protect your craft or your product with Bovida and see how much money you're you're losing by not using Bovida. We have a, a what we call an ROI calculator online. So you can plug in all of your your information, your numbers, and it's going to spit out a number and say, okay, when you're not using Bovida, here's how much you're losing for this investment, small investment into your operation. Here's how much money you're going to essentially make or save by using Bovida. So we'll We'll put that up on the screen or in the description so you can visit that as well. And we want to engage you to participate with us. Uh, please uh, employ our social media assets and and communicate with us about your own experience in the field with cannabis flower. Scott, how do we get a hold of Bovida? On Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at Bovida Cannabis, 
And you can feel free to email us info at bovidainc.com with any questions or concerns, and we will address them. And we'll also have links in there for you to find John Burfellow, a fine fellow from British Columbia that has been a great friend to us. He's a great friend to the cannabis industry at large and to patients that are seeking quality outcomes through cannabis. Johnny, we uh, thank you. I can't thank you enough for participating today. Well, thank you very much for allowing me to weigh in on this subject that is so important here, not just for Canadians, but around the world as cannabis starts legalizing. Yep. Brian, right. Brian thanks, thanks for having me, guys. Thanks for your expert advice. Uh, there'll anytime. Be, there'll be more. We're all in this together. Uh, Bovis podcast, Cultivate, is intended to bring you the people and the technology that are blazing a trail in the cannabis industry. John Burfellow certainly is. Uh, Brian Rice certainly is. We're doing our best to bring you the best quality we can. So join us and thank you. That was a great podcast. I know we talked a lot about Canada because uh, John Burfellow is in Canada and, and there's a lot of news coming out of Canada, but this is not just an issue in Canada. It's this a, is world, a yeah, worldwide issue. Worldwide. I mean, all the testing that we've done internally has been in the States. So over those hundred samples that we took, 90% of them were below that that range that you want to be at. That's all in the U.S. It's all substandard. So the point is there's action that you can take. And if you reach out to your dispensary, if you reach out to your LP, if you reach out to whomever is providing your cannabis and implore them to take two-way humidity control seriously, um, it's a solvable problem. This is a crisis that we don't have to have linger beyond these first nascent years of this business. It's time. Let's have standardization. Let's have cannabis at a particular quality level, minimum expectations that we can all rely upon. So put Boveda in your stash and you won't have dry cannabis. Maximize your cash. Well, there's that part of it, too. I'm actually hesitant to talk about the um, return on investment part of it because so much of the ethic in the cannabis industry is about medicine or about patients getting help. And whenever you bring up the commercial aspect of it, even though everyone is fully aware that they're in this business to make a living and they're in this business to make a profit. Um, what did you What did you say the other day? You You kind of coined a phrase about specifically California, but I think it kind of applies to a lot of the world. Something uh, they they sold their soul. Oh, yeah. So when this happened in Canada, it also happened in in California. Everything began with patients and medicinal applications for cannabis. So everything was about taking care of the patient. The way that the lobbyists got the legislation passed in each one of these jurisdictions, it's all about helping patients that are suffering with pain, that are suffering with cancer, that are suffering with a lot of health issues. So the altruism at the outset was outstanding. But over time, as these uh, businesses have uh, evolved, it's become less about the patient and more about the balance sheet. And what we talked about and where I went with it was I I had actually talked to a fellow that lost his wife to cancer and his motivation for becoming a trimmer out in the Sierra Nevadas was he wanted to help his wife have access to really high quality cannabis for her end of life. And great motivation, you know, uh, really related to the guy. I really felt, you know, the, the sincerity in what he was doing. And he coined the phrase, he said, California sold its soul. This industry has sold its soul because it's no longer about the patient. And the bad news was they sold their soul. The good news is, as all of us know, there's a lot of redemption in life and there's an opportunity to reclaim your soul. And there are certain things that one would need to do to reclaim their soul. So it was suggested that each one of the stakeholders in the industry take responsibility for the fact that we have collectively sold our soul and to reclaim it. And how would you do that? You'd start maybe a fund where you would allow terminally ill patients to have access to cannabis without restriction. And uh, that would certainly be an, an auspicious goal, but something that's totally possible if people put their minds to it. So, awesome. Yeah. You can't help others before you help yourself. So when it comes to growing and, and selling cannabis, 
you need to put an extra couple bucks on your bottom line, store used bulb in a package with it. So then in return, you're helping others by bringing them the high quality cannabis that you intended to bring to all these patients. And I, I tell people, if you gave us 30 cents, we'll give you a dollar. Right. And they look at me like I'm from Mars and it may be something else that's causing them to think that. But realistically, if you give us 30 cents, we'll give you a dollar. And if you don't use Bovida, you're going to lose more money on your cannabis than if you do do use Bovida. That's the bottom line. It works and it works in such a way where you're actually getting a dividend. And to explain that to somebody who spent all their uh waking hours worried about that crop getting through the season and getting to the testing lab without having it get dinged for pesticides or for some other issue. And then they're faced with uh, all this long list of cost of goods sold, all the inputs that went into the nutrients and the water and the electricity and the packaging, and they get down to it. That It's hard to get them to see the unique value of Bovida in that we are indeed a cost of goods sold, but the cost is lower than the dividend. So your net result is you come out ahead and we can, we will guarantee that you will come out ahead because that's the experience that some of the premier growers that store and package with Bovida are experiencing. And, uh, that's an exciting place to be. It's a, it's a fun, I know you have had a blast in Canada uh, managing that market and, and dealing with all those wonderful Canadians. I've had the same experience this last year in California. People are starting to wake up to the fact that proper, precise, two-way humidity control makes a dramatic difference in outcomes. Every 1% of moisture matters. And again, we can show you all this information. So let's get in touch and figure it out. And we're all in this together. So uh, don't anybody think that they're on the outside looking in. We want to be connected. Visit us at Bovida Cannabis. On Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And then email us, info at bovidainc.com with any questions that you have. We sincerely appreciate you taking the time to participate in this podcast. Thank you very much. You're listening to Hayes Radio Network, Cannabis Lifestyle Radio.